Hello and welcome to the latest in our series of webcasts with key figures in the debate on the 2014 Scottish independence referendum. In the hot seat today is Blair McTougall, head of Better Together, which is the official campaign to keep the union. You've been sending in your questions all week for Mr McDougall, and now he's got time to answer them. Good afternoon, Mr McDougall, first Hello. of all. Uh, let's get on to the, uh, the questions that have been sent in to us uh, via the BBC Scotland News website. Let's start with an issue which has been rumbling throughout the independence debate for the last few months, which is the European Union. Uh, P. Kelly from Elgin has sent in, why will the British government not enter into contingency discussions with the Scottish government over the practical arrangements if the referendum leads to independence? This is a question which mm. Alex Hammond is also asking now. Well, I think that the job of the UK government is to run the UK in the interests of the whole UK and in the interests, uh, interests of Scotland. Uh, we will either vote to stay in the United Kingdom or to leave the United Kingdom in the right time to be talking about how we then unstitch and separate the United Kingdom will be if Scots vote for that. I think in the meantime, it's for the nationalists to set out um, what their proposals are. In the meantime, I think it's right that the UK government gets on with their job. Is that a responsible attitude, do you think? Because we know they must certainly entertain the view that there could be a yes vote in 2014. Therefore, wouldn't it be responsible for the government to to have discussions about that scenario. I mean, that, that's sensible, isn't it? That's common well, sense. Well, there'll, there'll be a period after after any vote, um, if there is a yes vote, between um, that vote and independence. I think that um, up until that point, it's right that the governments, uh, both governments actually, uh, focus on getting on with the job that they're elected to do. Um, and I think that we'll have this big debate. Both sides will set out uh, their decision. But I think it's, it's premature before anyone's actually cast a vote to be entering into uh, negotiations about how to separate uh, Scotland from uh, the rest of the UK. Now, this is something that the Electoral Commission, when they issued their report into the referendum process earlier on this week, said, they said actually the two sides, for the sake of, of voters, should get together and agree a position of what will happen if there's a yes vote, what will happen if there's a no vote. You seem to be rejecting that advice from the Electoral Commission. I, I don't think at all. I think both the, the, the UK government and ourselves have said that it, what the UK uh, Electoral Commission said was a fairly straightforward thing, which was some simple practical procedural um, information for people about the, the, what would happen uh, in the event um, of either a yes vote um, or, or, or a no vote. And actually, uh, the Electoral Commission, when questioned on this, said that they weren't actually asking for pre-negotiations. They were just asking for some really simple practical information. Like what? Like the fact that um, if people stay, I guess, within the United Kingdom, um, there'll, there'll be um, a, 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 another general election. Um, that if they uh, uh, leave, uh, decide to leave the United Kingdom, that negotiations will begin for independence. But look, that practical simple is that, it? Uh, that practical simple uh, 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 information, which is the kind of thing that the Electoral Commission said was what they were looking for, isn't for me to write or for Yes Scotland to write. It's for the two governments to to to, to, to talk about. Um, but. To be clear, do you think that's all the detail the Electoral Commission were talking about? Then? I think that's that's what uh, uh, Mr. McCormick, the Commissioner, um, suggested when when he was interviewed. It's not detailed policy information in terms of the, uh, 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 as I say, pre-negotiations for for what might happen. It's just simple practical information so that voters can can make a clear decision. Now, one of the key questions has been the status of independent Scotland in the European Union. Uh, William has uh, uh, sent us this question: Why has the Westminster government still not asked? the EU for advice. It's also something that Charles has picked up on, Garth Scott Lodge has picked up on as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know the situation, which is the European Commission has said quite clearly if a member state, i.e. the UK government, asks us for the status of independent Scotland in the EU, we will answer that specific question. Why haven't they done that? Well, I think that's just another way of skinning the same cat for, for the nationalist side. You know, the UK government shouldn't uh, enter into negotiations until um, uh, uh, the uh, people of Scotland have voted to leave the United Kingdom. We're some way, thankfully, um, away from that, that situation at the moment. But look, it's not a mystery what the European Commission's position is. Uh, Mr Barroso um, has said in countless television interviews, he's been backed up by uh, many other European figures, including in your interview with the Irish Foreign Minister um, recently, um, that a new state, and Scotland would be a new state, would have to go through an application process. Now, I don't think it's in any way unclear what the position um, of the, electoral, of the European Commission but is. But you can be 100% clear by giving them a specific scenario, which the Scottish Government would like, would like the UK Government to do now, which is saying to President Barroso, here's a specific scenario, give us your definite legal advice, and then that would clear up the debate, wouldn't well, it? Well, President Barroso has been really, really clear if there is a new state, and he was asked in the context of um, uh, Scotland, so he was clear about what he was saying, if there is a, a, a new state, that new state has to submit a new application for, for EU membership. Now, he has said that so many times that I've almost lost count 
um, of him saying that. That's been backed up by the President of the Council as well. People have uh, consistently said across Europe that if Scotland's a new state, it will have to have to negotiate. I don't think there's any doubt in that. Now, I think the onus is actually on the Scottish Government to set out what their negotiation strategy is. So we've not heard from them so far whether they acknowledge that they would have to uh, negotiate an opt-out on the single European currency, something which all new EU states have to sign up to. We've not heard whether they accept that they would need an opt-out on the Schengen Agreement on open borders, which you know, raises the possibility of border controls within the United Kingdom. And we've not heard whether what their strategy is for retaining uh, the rebate worth £135 to every Scottish family. Something that the Scot who actually negotiated the UK's membership of the EU in the first place, Lord Kerr, last week wrote um, was something that they didn't have a hope in hell um, uh, of getting in a negotiation. And wouldn't it be important for voters, because remember they're the most important people mm. in this particular campaign, wouldn't it be important for them to, to, to get the actual clear views of the European Commission on all of these subjects or what would happen in independent Scotland and the only way to achieve that is for the UK government to put a specific scenario. I mean surely you as a campaigner it would be very helpful to you if, if you believe that Mr Barroso's view is clear that you could say absolute with absolute certainty this is what the European Commission say. Well I don't accept that there's any doubt over what the European Commission is saying. I think that um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're a drowning man, uh, you, you, you cling for anything. And I think that the nationalists have you know, understandably been under the cosh on, on Europe since um, they were found to be um, sort of not telling the truth uh, in terms of their own legal advice um, on this. And again, I would say, look, the European Commission has set out what their view is. The UK government has set out their view. Um, it was three months since we were promised that the um, uh, uh, Scottish Government had finally commissioned the legal advice that they pretended they had. I think it's time that we heard something from them in terms of what their negotiation strategy is for getting through uh, uh, what would be an incredibly fast-track uh, negotiation to try to maintain all the things that, that we currently enjoy as part of a, a strong, influential country within the United Kingdom. Let's move on, uh, if we can. There's a question here from, uh, from Alistair which says, as much as I have read and listened to regarding the vote next year, what majority must the SNP gain to go ahead with independence? Surely 51% does not allow this, says Alistair. All that will do is split the country. What's your view on that? Well, we, we campaign very hard for fair referendum rules and we campaign for fair referendum rules because in the event of a, a, a close vote like they had in Quebec um, in the 1990s, it was really important that everybody had absolute confidence um, uh, uh, in the process. Um, we thought it was a big victory for our campaign that we finally got um, the First Minister and Nicola Sturgeon to agree um, to those rules and I think it is really important <coughs> that this the uh, whole process is run in a way that makes sure that if in, in the event of a marginal result that both sides have confidence. Now, what I would say is I don't think we envisage there being a particularly close result. Um, we are campaigning hard to what make sure... What result do you envisage uh, I there think being? I, 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 we are confident of winning um, a strong victory. We're not taking people for granted. We're not give being complacent. A I won't give a, give a, complac uh, I won't give a, a, a percentage because we are eternal warriors against complacency and better together. Um, uh, but you know, we're not planning for um, a close result. The way you plan for a close result is by having rules that everyone can have confidence in. We took a step forward and we had, a, a, I think, a major victory on that this week. Um, but we have to continue to watch and make sure that this entire contest is run in a way that nobody can doubt the probity um, of the result. But in terms of, 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 of clarity, you know, whichever side gets one more vote than the other will have won. As far as you're well, I don't think anyone wants to see a, a scenario like that. Um, but, you know, this, is, this will be a democratic vote. Uh, and clearly, um, you know, 50 plus one votes um, is enough. But I think for people on uh, my side of the argument and our side of the argument, um, the vast majority of Scots who wish to stay in the United Kingdom, um, uh, the challenge is to make sure that they get out and vote. You know, if there's any complacency creeps into this, um, if we have a low turnout um, and there's some, you know, any sense of there being um, uh, complacency going into the vote, then you do risk a situation where you have a close vote. If people believe in the United Kingdom, if they believe that Scotland is stronger than the United Kingdom, they need to go out and vote for that in 2014. And we'll be working very hard, not just to convince people, but to get people out to vote on the day of the referendum. We've had uh, quite a few questions in on, on the issue of the benefits of, of independence, benefits mm. of staying within the union. Fiona has sent us uh, quite a lengthy question, but it's, it's very interesting. What benefit is there to me as an unpaid carer, she says, with disabled children uh, staying tethered in a union which is led by a coalition which is hell-bent on ostracising people with disabilities? Fiona continues, my children, if we... My children, if we stay in the union, face an uncertain future where they'll have to fight to get support and services to allow them to be part of society. My children didn't ask to have special needs, but what we see 
coming from Westminster is a sustained attack on the poor and the disabled and the vulnerable. I do not think an independent Scotland of any political hue would be so cruel, says Fiona. Well, look, I grew up in a family um, in, in, I guess, similar circumstances, a family on benefits. Uh, my mother, mother, mother was disabled. If I thought for one moment that independence was the answer to the kind of poverty and disadvantage um, that, that's described in that question. Um, I wouldn't be campaigning for better together. I would have, I'd be off campaigning for, for, for Yes Scotland. But I don't think it is. And what I find sort of personally distasteful um, about the way that benefits is spoken about is that the misery that people do face um, in low incomes, particularly um, at, at the moment, um, is just used as another political tool another tool, another wedge to drive between us and people in the rest of the United Kingdom. It isn't a policy debate for the nationalists. If it was a policy debate for the nationalists, they would have set out what the benefit system would look like in an independent Scotland. We don't know how the benefits would be paid, we don't know what they would be, and we don't know at what level but, they would be paid. But what we do know is that the vast majority of voters in Scotland didn't endorse the Conservatives at the last general election. And yet they have a coalition government which is making very significant decisions affecting tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of lives here in Scotland. Well, they have, they're governed by a party they didn't vote for. Well, there's a debate to be had on policy on benefits, and my point was that that should be a debate on policy and it shouldn't be used as another way to try to divide um, people in Scotland from their friends and family um, uh, in the rest of the UK. But there's also that, uh, that other argument that the, that the nationalists make about this being about um, the government in Westminster. Um, governments come and go. Governments last for five years and then sometimes, uh, sometimes are kicked out. Um, independence would be forever. Um, and the argument that the nationalists make about an independent Scotland doesn't rest on the colour of government that there was in Westminster. When there was the longest period of uh, sustained Labour government in our history, 13 years of Labour government, all the way through that they argued for independence too. Um, as I say, I don't think this is a debate about democracy. I don't think for them it's a debate about the policy of welfare reform. It's about what they've always argued for, which is separating us from our friends and family in the rest of the United Kingdom. Do you think, do you not think though that an independent Scotland, given the way most voters in Scotland uh, vote, would be more socially just, would have a different set of priorities to those of the Conservative government? Well, I think we have substantial devolution over issues like health and education um, uh, uh, at the moment. But my question about, about that is what sort of uh, vision for an independent Scotland are we actually being asked? So for years we've had Jim Mather going around telling people that it will be a low tax um, economy that will be cutting corporation tax. Uh, Blair Jenkins, who sat in this chair um, in the last interview, has been going around telling people that we'd be paying 57% tax like, like in Norway. Now, we need to choose which vision of uh, a, a, an independent Scotland we're actually being offered um, here. Um, and it's, it's, it's deeply unclear. So people will argue uh, from a left-wing uh, perspective. Some people will argue from, from a right-wing perspective. But I think for the, the nationalists, and particularly for the SNP, it's time they chose what vision they're actually putting forward to us. Doug has sent us this question. Will Blair tell us what the positive case for the union is without trying to tell us, what, tell us that it's a big, bad world like Alistair Darling always does? Well... Our argument is pretty clear. We think we get the best of both worlds at the moment. You get the strength and opportunities um, and shared risk um, of the United Kingdom with a distinctive Scottish Parliament with powers over things, total powers um, over things like um, health and education. We think that on the economy we're better together because we sell twice as much um, to the rest of the United Kingdom as we do to the rest of the world. We think that for uh, social reasons we're better together. If you or I, uh, God forbid, um, have some sort of rare, rare illness, we can go to any NHS hospital in the whole of the United Kingdom um, and be treated. Um, equally, if you, you know, fall down the stairs in Euston Station, you go to uh, St Thomas's Hospital, you, you get uh, treated without, without being charged. There are things that bind us together um, in this country. If I was French, I'd get, I'd get treated without being charged as well, wouldn't Not it? in the same way that you would um, uh, in the NHS, and particularly not if you didn't have your E-Treble 1 uh, form uh, uh, in your back pocket. But all these things bind us together, and 300 years of shared history and shared family history. We have um, 800,000 Scots working and living um, in the rest of the United Kingdom, taking advantage of the opportunities there. We have 500,000 um, uh, English people, I think, living um, within, within Scotland. But, but if, if an independent Scotland and the rest of the UK were both in the European Union, they could live and work wherever they wanted to, couldn't they? I mean... Well, I think uh, that would continue to well, be the case. Take the economic argument, um, uh, 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 for example. Um, if you ask any small business person whether it's as easy to trade with countries in the European Union like Germany or France as it is to trade um, with uh, our home market 
of uh, the rest of the United Kingdom, they would tell you that actually um, uh, 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 it's quite a different affair um, trading um, uh, with, with, with the EU, even within the single, single market of the European Union. And the argument is sort of fairly, fairly simple. When you have such an important home market, when you have so many jobs dependent on the Union of the United Kingdom, why would you even risk making it more difficult to trade? Josh has written into us, do you still th uh, stick by your claim that Westminster subsidised Scotland to the tune of £1,200, conveniently failing to recognise that independent Scotland's GDP would include around 90% of current UK oil receipts? Or do you agree with the STUC when they say that the £1,200 deficit figure is flawed and the Better Together campaign should not be using it? That's from Josh. Well, I think it's important to say that £1,200 figure was not something that we thought up or something which uh, the UK government had, had thought up. It was independent analysis by the respected um, Institute for Fiscal Studies. So this wasn't, wasn't our figure. But look, there'll be a lot of he said, she said um, on this, and I think people sometimes get, get a little bit uh, fed up with this. But one of the good things about the length of time we've got to debate this is that we can have a proper debate about the finances um, of an independent Scotland and how that relates to um, being within the United Kingdom and what the, what the benefits um, do you think Scotland risk can this. afford independence? We've never argued that Scotland couldn't be independent. Um, the question is always, um, would we be better or worse off um, inside or outside? And for the reasons I've given, you know, the number of jobs that rely on access to um, the single UK market, on being able to trade uh, freely with each other, but also on the, the, the wider stability that being part of the United Kingdom gives us at a time of international financial turbulence, um, we would argue that uh, financially uh, we'd be better off. But of course, it's not the only argument for staying together. Alex Salmond, uh, this is a question from Craig um, from South Ireland. So Alex Salmond recently asked people to imagine what Scotland, what Scotland was already independent and instead voting to join into the Union. If this was the case, what would your most compelling argument for joining the Union be? Well, I think we're being asked to go into a, uh, a polling booth and not the TARDIS. I, I, they, often, they often come up with this, this argument and I, I, I just don't quite understand it. Look, um, 300 years ago when uh, the union was being considered it was scots um, who were strongly arguing for it um, as an idea um, uh, uh, the historian colin kidd i think quite um, uh, convincingly argues that actually the, the union was a, was a scottish invention so look at things now um, if if we had such close family and, and friendship ties as we do uh, within the united kingdom would we choose to go into to the union now of course we would if so many jobs relied on trade um, and the shared um, uh, uh, economic risk um, an opportunity that we enjoy uh, uh, across the United Kingdom, would we have gone into the Union? Um, I think we would. Um, I think that it's, a, it's an nonsensical so, argument so to is, try to base, so, base the case so for So are the Scotland. people of Ireland suddenly wanting to send MPs to Westminster then? There well, are lots of trading links, there are lots of family links, and yet they're not knocking at the door to join into the Union, are they? Well, I don't think that Ireland's position within the Union um, historically was, was, was particularly similar to Scotland's uh, position uh, uh, within, within the United Kingdom. Um, but look, I think the vast majority of people um, <coughs> in Scotland um, recognise that there is, there is a sort of false choice being put before them, that somehow it's, it's between uh, rule from Westminster and, and rule in Scotland, or somehow it's between uh, feeling Scottish and feeling British. Our argument is you can have the best of both worlds. You can have the strong Scottish Parliament over the total powers over things like health and education, and you can have the strength and security and shared risk um, of being part of the United Kingdom. Um, we have a question here from, from Stuart. The No campaign has relentlessly harped on about the uncertainty of an independent Scotland, so what can Blair say with certainty about Scotland staying in the Union? Can he guarantee that we will stay in the EU? Can he guarantee that Tories will not win the 2015 general election? Um, you can't guarantee any of that stuff, can you? But the important thing to note here is that governments come and go. A decision to leave the United Kingdom will be forever. There'll be no going back uh, from, from that decision. So we need to make sure that we make, make the right decision. And that's why it's so important that the Nationalists do provide certainty for their case. They only have to win this once. You can't you know, kick them out after five years. Once we've made this decision to leave the United Kingdom, that's it uh, forever. But on the question, the question of the EU, look, all three parties within, within Better Together um, are agreed that we should stay within the United Kingdom. There's a debate about what the best way to do that is but there's one thing that's absolutely certain that if the nationalists get a yes vote scotland will be leaving the uk and so will be leaving the european union and i think that all the arguments that are there and there are strong arguments for why scotland and the united kingdom are both better off within the european union are also arguments for staying within the united kingdom we're better when we work together did david cameron's speech offering in a referendum that help your campaign I don't think it. I, I, I think what was interesting about the response to it was that um, Alex Salmond immediately claimed that it was a game-changing moment 
um, in the debate. Um, I think it was a, if it was a game-changing moment, it was a bit of an own goal, because immediately all their arguments for leaving the United Kingdom, which I think are very similar to UKIP's arguments for leaving the European Union, um, were exposed for what they were. They didn't make sense. So when Nicola Sturgeon went to give her speech um, in Dublin, she claimed that our biggest international, uh, uh, our, uh, our biggest trading partner um, as Scotland um, was the European Union. It's not true. Scotland sells four times as much to the rest of the United Kingdom as it does to the European Union. So if it's important for Scotland to stay within the European Union for economic reasons, it's four times as important for Scotland to stay within the United Kingdom Union. Let's go on to another issue. Stuart has sent us this question. Considering the parties in the anti-independence campaign struggle to agree on further devolution in the event of a no vote, and there may be a referendum on the EU in four to five years' time, why should Scotland vote no? Well, all three parties within uh, Better Together are in the process of setting out um, what they think um, on, on further devolution. Um, Liberal Democrats have already set out um, substantial proposals. The Labour Party have said that they will have an interim report from their own um, devolution commission coming up in, in, a, in a couple of months. And I think last week Ruth Davidson gave a speech that, you know, 10 years ago I don't think anyone would have thought that a Conservative leader in Scotland would give where she, she embraced um, uh, wholeheartedly um, further devolution. But I think the point here is that people understand the difference between um, an irreversible decision to leave the United Kingdom uh, and separate from our, our nearest neighbour um, and a decision on further devolution. Further devolution involves back and forth within the United Kingdom. Independence means leaving the United Kingdom. And I think that people, people understand that. But ultimately, I think people should judge us by our actions on this. I remember as a Labour Party activist in 1997 listening to Alex Salmond saying that he would no more trust Labour to deliver a Scottish Parliament um, than to uh, deliver a pizza. Well, I'm not sure what job Alex Salmond does now, but I'm fairly sure we have a Scottish Parliament. I'm fairly sure that when Labour um, extended powers um, to that Scottish Parliament, that Alex Salmond opposed it. I think people are clear that the choice is between uh, the risk and uncertainty of independence and positive change and continuing change with devolution within the United Kingdom. Um, Sam sent this question. Will the Better Together campaign tell us precisely what, if any, power Scotland would get in the event of a no vote? Because I wouldn't vote no unless there is a 100% guarantee that Scotland would get more powers over welfare spending and economic powers over our natural resources, as well as removing Trident from the Clyde. These seem to be the most important issues over the independence debate. Will there be a firm blueprint from either the, the three parties which you represent individually or collectively, so that Scots do know what will happen if they do vote no? Well, I think the simple answer to that is yes. All three parties have said, um, and I don't think it's a big surprise that they've said it, that long, long in advance of the uh, uh, independence vote, people will be able to look at um, uh, their proposals for the, for the future um, of, of devolution. So we'll have a clear blueprint which tells us what further powers they would like to see devolved to Edinburgh in enough time ahead of the 2014 referendum so that people can decide what to do? Well, it won't be a single blueprint. Uh, the three parties will put, put their case forward and people will be able to make a, make a judgment on that. Um, should Scotland have further devolution in your view, asks Sack Campbell. Um, I would like to see personally more devolution from Holyrood to local communities and from Westminster uh, to local communities. I don't think this should just be a debate about how much power um, our, our First Minister has. But I think on a personal level, um, like most Scots, I'm looking at, at, at the debate and watching the debate and, uh, 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 with interest um, uh, in terms of the future of devolution. I mean, last week I thought we had a, a very interesting contribution uh, from the IPPR, one of the more substantial and significant um, uh, proposals for the future of devolution that we've had. I thought it was a pity that the Nationalists dismissed it out of hand without even reading it. But um, like most Scots, I'll, I'll watch this debate and uh, decide what form of devolution um, I want towards the end of it. On, on the similar theme, Ewan asks, can Blair tell us what a no vote stands for? Does it mean that the devolved settlement is fixed, with Westminster being the ultimate controller of the purse strings? Or what powers a no vote will see further devolved, particularly in the fields of revenue raising and expenditure? If a no vote does not fix the devolved settlement, at what point will another referendum uh, be called? I mean, you've talked about the fact you'd you believe in, in, in a different kind of devolution, perhaps. I mean, do you think that, that Holyrood does need some further economic powers in those proposals? Well, in answer to the question uh, that, that was put, um, uh, all of the proposals from the three parties will be put um, in front of people far in advance of the referendum, and they can, they can, they can make, a, make a judgment on that. Um, I would say, again, judge, judge the, the pro-devolution parties uh, by their actions. When the Scottish Constitutional Convention um, was going through, which um, established uh, devolution 
in the first place. The Nationalists stood outside it and demanded um, independence. Um, when Labour established the Calman Commission, which has delivered um, significant additional um, tax raising powers uh, for Scotland, powers that uh, are now being uh, 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 transferred to Scotland, something that I think most, most viewers may not know, um, the Nationalists um, opposed it. When that fresh devolution proposal was put forward by respect to think tank IPPR last week, they opposed it. So, you know, I think judge people by their actions. We have a record of bringing forward devolution proposals and delivering on them. Um, and I think that people will see our proposals from those three parties before the referendum and they'll be able to make a judgment. Alan says, I wonder if you could give me three examples of how Scotland will be better after a no vote. Please note not three examples of how we wouldn't be worse off, but three definitive examples of how Scottish society will be improved by staying in the union. Well, I think that one of the, the great things about being in the union is that it enables us to better take advantage of our natural um, and our human um, uh, resources. So this week uh, on, uh, on Better Together's uh, Facebook page, um, we have launched a campaign talking about how um, the disproportionate levels um, and, and fantastic levels of uh, research funding that uh, Scotland receives from the UK helps ensure that we have scientific excellence, that our inventors are coming up with new medicines, new inventions, new ideas, but also that keeps our universities better. That will continue um, uh, uh, into the future uh, and continue to make sure that we, we lead the world on that. I think that you can make a similar case in terms of the investment we get in green energy, where we um, uh, receive about a third of, of Britain's green energy subsidy. We pay only for about a tenth of that. I think you can also make the case in oil, where we'll be better equipped to squeeze every last drop of oil um, uh, out of the North Sea if we're part of the United Kingdom and able to share the risk and the cost of decommissioning. Now, we're running out of time, so let's run through a few uh, other topics that we can do. Um, what, John asks, why is the Yes campaign running such a negative campaign? Peter also asks something uh, similar as well. There's no positive case from the union most of the time that we hear uh, those who, who uh, don't want Scotland to be independent. Similar theme from Scott Watson as well. I mean, what, it is a particularly negative campaign from the Better Together. Well, I don't, I don't accept that at all. If you look at our campaigning materials, Organizing. if you look at um, what we're out uh, doing on the doorstep day after day, um, we're talking about almost nothing other than um, the positive case for staying within the United Kingdom. But the people who tend to say that we're negative um, are the nationalists who don't want us to ask questions. Um, they don't want us to ask questions because they haven't thought through um, their own proposals uh, for independence. Um, and it isn't just Better Together who are being told to sort of you know, shut up and stop asking questions. Um, when the, the former head of the Royal Navy questioned what the impact of independence would be on defence jobs in Scotland, he was called a scaremonger. When one of the leading Edinburgh uh, pensions um, advisors questioned what the impact would be on private pensions in Scotland, he was called a scaremonger. Even when Emmanuel Barroso, the President of the European Union, expresses an opinion on Europe, he's accused uh, of scaremongering. And I think that one of the reasons the nationalist campaign is in such difficulty is that people see the nationalists telling them to shut up and stop asking questions and they rightly assume that what that means is that they don't have answers to those questions in the first place. On the issue of identity, I'd like to ask what role you think identity has in the independence debate. Do you think how we see ourselves will shape our future, asks Jamie. And Thomas, do you feel Scottish or British? Um, I feel Scottish first, um, I feel British second. Um, I have uh, English and Welsh, Welsh blood in me. I feel very much a kind of product of the, um, uh, of the United Kingdom. Um, what role will it play? I, I think that one of the interesting things that we've seen um, over the last six months is how content Scots are to feel, yes, fiercely and proudly Scottish, but also to have a, have a sense of Britishness and to understand that that's not a choice that they have to make uh, 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 between the two of them. Um, I think identity uh, will be there. Um, I think the nationalists obviously believe that identity uh, will play a role uh, in the decision that people will make. I don't think it will, will help them in the way that they, they, they think because I don't think that Scots um, want to be made to feel that they're choosing between two uh, deeply held and, and cherished identities that most Scots actually uh, uh, are perfectly comfortable having. Um, the Yes campaign have offered to publish their, their list of their donations um, at the same time as you do. Is that an offer you're going to take them up on? Well, we have always said that we would publish um, uh, the names of all of our, 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 our donors in line, done it, in, in line with the, the, um, uh, uh, the Electoral Commission um, advice. Uh, we also said, I should say, that we would support what the Electoral Commission said before we saw it. We're glad that the Nationalists 
um, once they saw that they agreed with the proposals, did um, did the same. But we've always said we will um, publish our proposals. Why don't you, um, in the tell, first me now. you can tell well, me now. We always said we publish our proposals in the first quarter of this year. We will do it. Why uh, wait? Raymond, Raymond, you know from your own recent experience what happens when you uh, criticise the nationalists or speak out um, uh, I'm ask, I'm against the nationalists. You about the better we, why, we have a duty. Why, we have a duty why? of care to the people who have given to us. But look. Before too long, before too long, before too long, to let them know who's long, funding your we've always said, we've always said, before too long, we will publish um, uh, the names of all of our donors, and people will be able to make um, so when will uh, that a judgment. Happen? We've said we'll do it in the first quarter of this year, so you won't have to wait too long. Okay, Blair McDougall, thank you very much thank indeed you. for joining us for this uh, webcast. Blair McDougall of the Better Ca Together campaign there. Um, in the second of these webcasts. And for more on the independence debate, including background analysis, latest developments in the story, go to the BBC Scotland News website and click on Scotland's future. But from all of us here, thank you very much for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>